Hi, everybody. My name is Joanne Webb, and I am the director of the Actors Fund Work Program. Uh, and I'm really happy to be here because we have, we have a wonderful panel for you to learn some things about. Uh, we have to publicize in uh, Los Angeles our, this particular, this, when we ever do anything on a career panel, we can never say over 50 here in LA. We have to say over 40 <laughs> because uh, nobody wants to admit, <laughs> you know, what can I say? It's a whole different thing. They can do it differently in New York, but in LA, that's how we have to do it. But uh, just to get you all here, okay? So it's a nice full audience and uh, we have a great, great uh, show for you today. I want to call the show. Anyway, uh, I want to first of all talk a little bit about the Actors Fund because uh, we are in the process of putting together a, a video for the Actors Work uh, program. But uh, until that happens, I am your video. And I want you to know that the Actors Fund has been around for uh, over 134 years. Uh, we are, uh, you know, I'm not going to give you the whole history, but we really came around with theater and, and all of that, and uh, Barnum and Bailey and the circuses and all that kind of fun live entertainment was happening. And people who were actors, and by the way, the broad word of actors, if you swept the stage, you were an actor. If you did makeup, you were the actor. Whatever you did, you were called the actor, and actors were not treated so well. And uh, we came about to be, be able to support that process. And uh, if you don't know this story and you want to learn more about it, how many of you have been to the Actors Fund or the or orientation for the Actors Fund Work Program? Any of you who haven't and you're interested, based on this panel, please come to one of our orientations, which are on Mondays at 1 o'clock. And uh, it, we are in this building, Suite 400, and we Everything we do uh, is cost free to you, um, uh, other than registration for computer classes, uh, which are very minimal. And we really want to get you in a position so that you can do what you do and do really well. We are about many things. We're about health services. We are about uh, social services when people need help with their rent or or, um, or getting uh, certain bills paid, but also learning about their money, how to, how to utilize it in the best possible way. So we are about many, many things, and I hope you come and see us if you haven't already. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome our panelists. Uh, and uh, I'm, I couldn't be more pleased if I tried. Uh, but uh, our panelists today is, um, uh, we have to my left here, they're all to my left actually, uh, Sandra D. Robinson, who I have watched grow and develop through her process, which is very exciting. We also have Nancy Linari. Nancy, uh, also someone uh, we've had the opportunity to work with, and I, it's going to be fun to hear her story and what her process was. Joel Landy, who came to us uh, through uh, a connection networking through Sandra and uh, is up here, and uh, he comes through being an actor and also a, a drive, uh, you do driving, and uh, yeah, and also um, stunt work, and uh, so that'll be exciting. And Mary Ann, Mary Ann actually, Mary Ann uh, uh, Bywinner, uh, she came to us actually uh, as a volunteer at the Actors Work Program, and it's very exciting the work that she's doing now, you know, to keep going and can still do her acting, which is really what this is all about. So whether you're an actor or you do any other areas in, in the business, uh, this is about saying what happens when you're over 40 years old and you start feeling like the world is looking at you a little bit more differently. And uh, if you look at statistics, um, and I'm not going to quote anything specific, but you're seeing what's happening right now is there is such a strong need. Um, we just had a, a, one of our people from our Baby Boomer Boot Camp gave out an article a couple weeks ago that was on uh, on retirement, you know, that people aren't even able to think about retirement because they have to keep working. But even through that process, we've been c come through a very difficult economy. We're still going through that. The uh, world of work is changing. 
we can't even tell you totally what it looks like yet because the paradigm has not landed yet. So when you hear politicians talk about, oh yes, we need to, you know, and they're looking at unemployment figures and saying, how come it's not this? Well, it's not going to be what it was because it's going to be very different. What it was is gone and now we're creating a whole new world of work. And that affects everybody, including people in the entertainment industry. So that's what we're going to focus on today. So, um, so sit back, relax. Please, please write any questions that you might have that might come up for you and raise them up so Dennis can see them and uh, we can collect them and we can ask those questions in our last half hour. So let's get started with Sandra. Hi, everybody. I want to second that too. I think for everybody up here, we'd love to have questions. So that I mean, we're here to serve you. I think so. Um, please don't hesitate to put questions down and send them over to us. So um, you know, I, actors work with stories, and even if you're not an actor, you're in the you're in the industry of helping to present stories. So I'm going to start with a story. Is that okay? Um, I recently moved from uh, here, from Los Angeles, to Austin, Texas. And um, I'd only lived in LA and, and New York for a, you know, a long time, because that's what I had to do being in the industry. So when the opportunity opened up with the business that I'll discuss with you in a second, um, we, my husband and I, who's also in the industry, we moved to Austin. And I've been there for, I'll, I'll be honest with you, less than a month. <laughs> <laughs> But we've been looking for two years, so we've really thought this through. Um, but the interesting thing is, I was so excited to go there. I have horses. I'm actually utilizing them now in the industry that I'm that I'm uh, kind of creating, <laughs> um, and delving into my new newer venture. And uh, so we moved these two horses from here. We cut it down to two, and we we brought them to Austin. Now, in my human mind, because I, I like to study animal behavior, I've done that since I was a kid, and I loved psychology. So, like, you can see where my mind is. In my human mind, I'm thinking, I'm giving you a great gift. Horses in Los Angeles, even in the you know best places, a lot of times they're kept in stalls. They're kept in barns, and that kills me because I want to see them run free. The most beautiful pictures of me looking at horses that I think are most beautiful are when they're running and galloping, you know, and being free. So I'm thinking, I'm going to give you something awesome. I'm giving you acres of pasture, and the whole drive I am picturing in my mind, telepathically communicating with my horses how awesome this is going to be. So I get them there, and you know, I lead them out to the pasture. I you know, put the halters on at the barn, lead them out to the pasture, and I'm looking, and I'm excited, and my horses are feeling the excitement, and I take the halters off, and they run 10 feet, and then they turn and run back to the barn. <laughs> And I, like the stupid human, I'm sure it was amusing, I'm standing in the pasture pointing to their butts as they're running away, and I'm pointing at the pasture going, that's for you, that, that's for you. And I felt stupid, and I'm walking back, I'm dragging the halters with me, and I'm walking all these acres back. I'm like, what is wrong with these animals? Don't they see that they can have all this freedom? Don't they see how big their world is? And they didn't. And I realized, I've done this in my life. We all do this. We all stay close to the barn. We have our restrictions that we put on ourselves. And my part of my story is exactly that because there, we all have different ways we approached, you know, acting or the industry in general. I went into it because it was all I thought I could do. And it remained all I, could th all I thought I could do. And maybe that's why I never, you know, because I, I, I was so focused on this is all I can do um, that I visualized it so intensely. I was very fortunate to work for a very long, steady period of time. Now, steady doesn't mean I'm always getting paid well. We know how that works, <laughs> right? <laughs> steady means, you know, a couple of years are really good. And then, you know, I uh, remember being on a show that aired every Friday night and my friends in high school back in, you know, Pittsburgh were going, you must be making so much money. I was barely paying my portion of the rent in an old apartment in Playa del Rey. So, you know, we know that it can be up and down. But when it came time for me to start considering, well, what else can I do? Because the up and down was getting really rough. I mean, at one point, I, I've done a lot of soap operas. That's why most people would, may know my face. Um, I've done more soap operas than I think are on air right now. So that makes me feel kind of old. 
That and being on a panel of 40 over makes me feel kind of old. <laughs> it's that kind of day. But um, when I reached a point where I realized, you know, I have a brain, I'm actually a pretty smart chick, and I went from, honestly, making around half a million dollars. The next year, when we moved, I found my tax receipt. The next year, I made 5,996. I ended up homeless. That's a story for another day. But, um, and I've, obviously I'm not homeless now, I've kind of found my way back, but, but it, was a, it was a detour that I probably didn't need to take if I'd had the support and the confidence in somebody to show me that there were other things out there. Not only show me the pasture, but lead me out there a couple of times. Because I did have people that showed me bigger pastures during that time. And, I, and they would say, go into casting go into this creative thing, go and do that. And I was qualified for all of those things. But, and I'm, and I'm not regretting it because it gives me the opportunity to share my story with you. But, um, but I didn't even consider that a possibility because I said, no, 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 I'm an actor. I can't do anything else. This is all I know. This is all I've studied. This is what I do. And I kept close to the barn. If somebody shows you a bigger pasture, Get people, make sure that you have people around you that support you in a bigger dream. Make sure you have people around you that think bigger than you do. So a coach, a mentor, a buddy, somebody that you look at and go, wow, man, you took that risk and it worked. Hang out with some risk takers that will open up your eyes to what is possible. Because I, in order to keep myself comfortable in my little tiny zone by my barn, surrounded myself with people like I grew up with. Even in a different city, New York, LA, I surrounded myself with the same people to reconfirm what I thought of myself. Is this sounding familiar to anybody? And if, it isn't, if it's sounding familiar and it's new to you, pay attention to that. Because you all have skills that you've been given that you can create something consistent for yourself and still do what you love, but I no longer have to worry about going homeless. <laughs> I know I've proven to myself that I have skills and I can use my intelligence and my, my, my God-given gifts to do something that I don't have to worry about where the next job is coming from. I don't have to worry whether I look like the casting director's ex-wife. I mean, we lose, as an actor, you lose stuff for weird reasons, you know? You're too tall. Well, sorry, I can't fix that. <laughs> you know, you're too short. Really can't fix that. I mean, then like some, some heels, you know. There are things that are without, beyond our power. So I think it was more than anything, when I took the opportunity to start a business, and by the way, the business I'm going to share with you is not the first one I did. I stepped out and didn't know what the heck I was doing. I started a bath salts business. Did I tell you this? No. Um, because I liked baths. And so I thought, I'm going to not bath salts, the drugs. <laughs> oh, for gosh sakes, no. Um, no, I, I liked take, taking baths. So I create, I'd got these dead sea salts and I put this whole thing together and I tested it and I put it in beautiful little packages and, and I thought I was gonna create this business. So I went out, I got my DBA and I read up on what to do. Nobody around me, I didn't have those supportive people, right? So I, I was really just kind of stepping forward and like a, bouncing off the walls. So I started this bath salts company. I'm making bath salts in my dining room and I remember calling my dad and going, Dad, it's like I'm in poltergeist. There's water seeping from my walls. He said, how many bath salts do you have? And I'm like, I have so many, you know, pounds over in this corner and so many pounds in that corner. And, and he goes, and you're in your dining room. You're attracting water because of the salt. And I'm like, oh, I can't do this in my house. <laughs> I really, like, I did not always plan well, okay? So that's the other thing, plan well. When you think you want to go in a direction, find people that know what to do and follow them. But what I, end, what I did end up doing that sort of suited me was um, an industry, it was a company that I developed called Charisma on Camera. And I currently help experts and CEOs and companies look and feel like a rock star when they have to get in front of a TV video camera public speak, basically getting out there and getting in front of people, which is what a lot of actors are so good at, um, comes very, very foreign to a lot of people. A lot of very intelligent, driven people have a very difficult time with um, stepping out and being seen. So I thought, well, I had to do that myself. That's why I teach what I teach. 
because my job as an actor was so important to me for two reasons. I said it was the only thing I knew how to do, but the real reason behind all that is that I had no self-esteem growing up. I was taught very limiting beliefs as a kid about my value. And when I got lucky with some acting gigs, I jumped on that because that, I didn't have to worry about who I was. I didn't have to worry about my value because I could be someone else. And Denny Aiello, who is just like a, just an awesome actor, he just wrote a book. And on the bottom of his book, it says, I don't know who I am until I'm playing someone else. And that was me. It's very common for actors to feel that way. So when I did get a fan following from the shows that I was on, and if you're sitting there going, I know her face, Another World, Sunset Beach, Bold and Beautiful, Days of Our Lives, General Hospital, I'm on something now, it's a new media um, show called The Bay, the series, I'm shooting that this weekend. So soap operas have been, you know, they fed me very well. There are other things I'll pop up in nighttime, but for the most part, my face is daytime. So um, I lost my track now. That happens when the blonde kicks in. Um, <laughs> but I, I got a fan following from being a lead character on some of these shows. And of course they said, well, we want you to come and represent our charity. Please get up on stage and, and invite people to give. And then they would hire me to do an infomercial, which we used to call hush money. Now I'm thrilled about it. But um, does it pays very well sometimes. But they would say, come represent this product. And I would have to basically sell something. The only way you can sell something is if you own who you are. When I'd get there, they would say, and you might have heard this if you go into commercial editions, just be yourself. Right? What did I say about what I thought I was? My file was empty. It was worse than empty, I realized. There was a negative, a negative number in there. So I had a really rough road um, to find who I was, that I was of value, then show that up on camera, and then be able to actually be comfortable enough with everything that I was, the good, the bad, the ugly, in order to reach other people. And once I managed that, then I was actually able to start selling things and getting people to bring money into the charity. And, and I thought, well, this is really cool. Um, I ended up teaching television hosts because that's what you do. You entice people, you bring people in, you, you lead them to a sale or you know, through a show. And, and so that's what I started doing. And eventually I turned that into you know, teaching entrepreneurs and it went from there. So you see, I started with something that was organic to me, so organic that it actually came from my biggest weakness. See? So my barn isn't always, some people say, oh, you're talking about your comfort zone if you talk about the barn. It's not always comfortable. It's just where you keep yourself. My horses aren't comfortable in a 10 by 10 stall. It's just where we keep them. It's what they know. By the way, it took three days and eventually they took step after step and you know, on like the fourth day, I opened up the door to the stall and my, my mare, my female took off, just And I stood there and went, yes, that's what I wanted. Freedom. And, you know, the way I look at it is God has big plans for you and he's giving you a bigger pasture that maybe you don't see. So surround yourself with the right people, which is you know, what I'm, I'm so adamant about now. I, I speak, um, I have clients all over the world. I work with them via you know, the internet. We do webinars and, and I coach people in any kind of presentation or anything that they need to do where they're stepping out. And a lot of times I have to refocus them and what their purpose is and why they're doing what they're doing. Even the most driven, intelligent people will see shiny things everywhere. And I have to refocus them, like, what are you here to give? Who do you most want to reach? What do you want your legacy to be? It's not that you have to give up your acting, but there's something that is a gift inside of you that you, know, that you can actually harvest and, and live in and still be really fulfilled. And not worry about where your next paycheck is coming from which is nice. It's really nice. And now I can take acting gigs. I can do things if I like them. Crazy concept. Or if I create them. And um, so I just think more than anything, it's empowering. And I want to empower you to you know, allow yourself to open up your eyes. Allow other people to open up your eyes. And don't shut down what could be 
you know, what God be, could be giving you. Because it's as excited as I got with my horses running into the pasture. I mean, imagine if you believe in a God, which I hope you do. What, what is he thinking when you're not going out to what he's giving you to be able to do in your life? So um, there's a lot out there. Um, the new venture, by the way, since we mentioned the horses, is actually utilizing the horses to build leadership and nonverbal communication. So what I've been doing with people on camera, I'm now doing it and letting nature, letting the horses actually do that. So taking people into a pen and having them work on the fact that horses, like they're just giant deer, giant prey animals, you know? We forget that because comparatively speaking, they're really big. But um, if you ride horses, anybody know horses? I know you do, Joel. So um, you can have this giant monster of an animal underneath you and a paper bag will, or a plastic bag will go flying across the trail and they'll jump like it's gonna consume them whole. So uh, they, they live in a state of you know, being a prey animal. So they live in a state of reading intention and energy in a split second. Here's a clue, we do the same thing. When you walk into an audition, your energy the second you walk in determines whether they're gonna have your, your, whether you have their attention or not. It's all about the powerful presence that you bring or the not so powerful presence that you bring. And I've gone through the gamut, even as an actor. I booked a lot and then somebody, I surrounded myself with the wrong people. There's a theme here, I hope you're picking up. And I let all those limiting beliefs be, you know, fed really, really deep in me. I was in a bad relationship and he had bad people and, and I ended up walking in to an audition and I lost it before I even opened up my mouth. So when I put people in with a horse, the reason I do this is they read your energy and your intention. They don't speak our language, of course that makes sense, but they particularly don't know the word why. They don't know why, they don't know your story, they don't know your blame, your excuses. They only see you as you are right now. And when I look at you in the audience, I see you as you are right now, just like you're doing with us. And if you live in that moment, which so many of us don't, we live in the past or we live in what could be, living in the moment is so empowering. And a lot of times, that's where you can find your outlet. That can be your business, that can be your money, that can be your very happy work day. You know, I never was an, I was never a waitress because first of all, I, I'm a klutz and you would not want me to be a waitress and I can't remember things. I even forgot my, my train of thought up here. I would be a horrible waitress, really, really bad. So, um, so that's, that's not for me. That's not where my gift lies. But it's also a job that I think would make me miserable. And I've had jobs that I made money and I was miserable. You don't have to be. You can, you, everybody in this room, if you're a creative, you're living kinesthetically. You want to do what feels good. So find something that feels good and talk with people that have bigger ideas than you allow yourself to have and do something with it. Let crazy ideas come into your head because that's what happened to me. And when somebody said to me, do what you're doing with television hosts, but do it with entrepreneurs, I went, what? What are you talking about? Why would anybody want that? Thank goodness somebody explained it to me because that's where my businesses came from. You know? Is that enough about me? I think so. Okay. Well, I just want to, I just want to, because um, I, I, I remember meeting you like probably almost seven years ago and, yeah. and the process and the changes and the transitions. I think it's, I, and, and you've really told the story so clearly, but, um, you know, there's the ups and there's the downs mm -hmm. of process of, of starting a business of, mm -hmm. of your own. I think part of it is, as you shared, finding a business that really, uh, connects the dots with who you are, you know, that's very important. Mm -hmm. But did you have to get any um, professional help, okay. uh, you know, in cool. terms of learning how to do yeah, a so business of your yeah, own? Yeah, so I didn't try to make bath salts in my dining room anymore? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, and, and that's another, I have a, an encouragement, yes, find somebody that can help you set up, understand, see the big picture, but um, definitely, and this is gonna sound a little woo-woo, but go with your gut when you have that person that you're, that you're trusting. Um, as I said, intelligent people, because I work with a lot of them, very intelligent, very driven, struck by the next shiny thing. So that was me. And when I first started my business, I thought, I still had a little bit of that old mindset where I thought, well, I don't know what I'm doing. So this person seems to know, and they said they know, and he says he knows, so I'm gonna follow whatever they said to do. 
well, what do you think ended up happening? I'm running around like a chick with my head cut off. And I was spending money in advertising and I was creating a visual look for my brand, but I made no money. And my husband's like, this is a really expensive hobby. And I was pissed. I was like, really, a hobby? Do you know how many hours I am spending? I am working 12 to 15 hours a day. You think this is a hobby? If this was a hobby, it would be more fun. I just said all the big red flags. I'm working too many hours, I'm not having fun. Obviously, he was right, I'm doing something wrong. So I actually took, and it wasn't that long ago, I think it was like a year, and a half ago, year and a half ago, I got frustrated, every entrepreneur does, and I took almost six months off. I still had a couple of private clients, but I didn't do anything, I just sat. And this is where, this is actually the point where I realized how important it is to just be. This is, also, when I was introduced to horse therapy, which is what I do as a der derivation of that, and um, the ability to let nature calm you down, heal you, and allow your creativity to come forward. And so it was during that downtime, when I was doing what I thought was nothing, that the next thing showed up for me. And not only the next thing, but also the clarity that I could look at somebody that said that they were a coach, that says, well, I make X amount of dollars and I can show you how to do this too. And I can feel whether they're legit. I can vet if I'm not sure, I vet them, which means I do the homework. I call up people they worked with. I follow the people they helped. Are they successful? Are they really doing what they said they're gonna do? And if they are, then you sit down and see, do you mesh? Meshing meaning not are you impressed by them? Do they get your values? Do they understand where you want to go? And then lastly, I'm not a big fan of signing up with somebody for more than six months as a coach. Do six months multiple times. But I think that if you are really driven, as you work with somebody in six months, you're gonna be a different person. And that coach may be good for you at that point, they may not. So, I would start with some blockages and work with a coach that would help me through that. And then I'm in a situation right now, in fact, that I have six more months with a coach who really isn't serving me at this point because I need something else in my business and he's not that guy. So be really careful who you take your advice from and don't run around like a chicken with your head cut off. Don't, don't you know, vet the people that you are thinking about working with or investing with. I'm a fan of investing, you know, whatever you can, even if it's, helping them, sitting alongside somebody that would mentor you, no matter how old you are. It's a great way that you can, that you can actually get information from people and watch how they build their business and learn. I, I think that what you're stating is so important because a lot of times we see, a lot of people see uh, stuff on coaching and I have a lot of friends that, you know, they, they took things for life coaching and, and, and all of that, which is, which is great. But it is about, you know, having the mentors you need and really being able to do that. Because I have a lot of friends who spent a lot of money and now they're having, now they're struggling, you know. So it is about being very clear of, and concrete about what you're doing. I know Joel will probably have something to say about that because you do it with executives. And the yeah. good thing about having a coach though too is another part of that puzzle where I'm saying have people around you that encourage you, see the bigger picture, allow it to happen, visualize what it would be like if it did happen. Instead of living in the, um, what if it doesn't, just for the heck of it, try living in what if it did work. And you know, I said surround yourself with people that can see that, but the other, the other side of that is um, do be very careful with the people that are encouraging you and make sure that they're not, you know, that, that they're grounded, if that makes any sense. Right. Um, then there was something else you touched on that I felt a spark for, but I can't remember what it was now, so I may... We can, we can come back to it a little bit later. Okay, we'll move over to Nancy Lanari, who I have gotten the opportunity to, to, uh, to meet here at the Actors Work Program, and I was so happy that you could come over and speak for us and Thank share you, your Joanne. own experience with what you're doing. I'm glad to be here. I'm just not sure how close to the barn I still am, so <laughs> I'm a little <laughs> self-conscious about that. Um, I am an actress. Nancy, you want to bring your, your mic up? Oh, sure. I'm sorry. I have been an actress for ever since I got out of college. I uh, am from Chicago, and I started in theater. And without, I don't want to say without a lot of work, but without some of the hassle that young people today have in the business, I became a member of the unions and started working. Chicago is a very vital 
place to work, and at the time, it was very, um, it was a natural progression for me to become equity after a SAG and do many things. I moved out here, and I still continue to work. I would call myself, most of my career, a blue-collar actor. I've never had a series, but I have always, until a point, always worked. It might be commercials were what was feeding me for a couple years. It might be episodic. It might be a couple of equity shows that kept me going. Um, when, and I have made changes as that. I've tried to adapt a little bit. As I, when I got pregnant with kids a little later in life, I decided, ah, now I need to focus on voiceover, which I'd always done but hadn't put as much energy or time or money into. And there's a lot of money that goes into these things as actors, as we all know. It's a lot of money um, to, to sort of be the hopeful actor who's going to get chosen. Um, when my kids were six and three, I had a wonderful husband. I was married uh, almost 20 years. My husband dropped dead one day at work. So there I was, already kind of an older actress, with a three-year-old and a six-year-old. And I think of it as kind of a perfect storm. He died six months after 9-11, and I think 9-11 changed many things, not just our, our sense of safety and our sense of community, some of it for the better, actually, but everything changed. The dot-com sort of collapsed. There were a lot of things that had sort of been on a roll as an actor, and it all changed. Everyone is fearful, understandably so. So to me, it was kind of a perfect storm. I was getting older. I had these two children. I was a really lovely second income in Los Angeles. I was not the primary income in my family with two kids. And when I had my kids, although I continued to work, I had my baby. So I wasn't working like I did before. I'm, you, you can have it all to a, to a degree, but it's hard to have it all. So uh, I'd love to tell you that I jumped right out of that barn right away, but <laughs> I had several years of, it was a pretty devastating time for me, and I was still raising children and trying to pay for things and, and raise children and, and, and heal. And all the while, I'm noticing, hmm, the work is not reliable anymore, but I don't know what else I can do. And um, if there's one thing I've always said about myself is, I'm really capable. I may not be brilliant at a lot of things, but literally, if you asked me to drive a big rig truck, by the end of the week, I would drive the truck. I'm not saying I would drive it well. I'm not saying that, but I would I get you where you needed to be. If you asked me to throw um, a function at a school for 250 people on a budget with a breakfast, with a program, I'll do it. I'm not saying it will be the best program, but it will be darn okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so I have all this, but I was really kind of lost, and I did seek out the Actors Fund, and I met Joanne, and I, she recommended that I come into a group called, I think it's On the Fence. Are you on the fence? Are you on the fence? Are you on the fence in the industry? In the industry. And the way I looked at it, I sort of had a condo on the fence. I was so <laughs> on the fence about what to be done with my life. But I did, and through the group, uh, a few things, uh, I'm really a work in progress with this um, parallel career stuff still. I think I have created some. I'm still looking for another way to use, because all those things I said about you were, were a tiny bit self-effacing, but you know, I'm not an idiot. I am capable, I am well-spoken, I'm a really good organizer. I'm not great at the tiny details, but I will make sure everything gets done. So I had these other skills. But I needed to keep my union benefits with two small kids. So I was looking for something else I could do within my skill set that, that would make this happen. And I uh, came to one of the meetings talking about audiobooks, which I had only done one or two of. But that industry, like everything else, has changed because of technology, I think. Technology, uh, non-union work, and celebrities taking all of our blue-collar work. So those are my, there's my little rant and I'm done. <laughs> so, but in order to compete in audiobooks, in my research, I needed to be able to record them, produce them at home, on my own time, in my own studio, edit them. I need to be able to turn in a finished product. My goal was to be successful enough that I don't have to turn in the finished product, but in order to compete, 
because I went from being an actor, if I'm not a celebrity, I'm still an actor here with good agents, but when I started in audiobooks, I had to go right down to the basement. Um, they didn't care what my credits were. And I was working with some people, I mean, I would be auditioning against a person who had done nothing but narrate books, no credits. But in the book world, they're up here, and in, I'm down here. So I did, I converted, I gave up, I gave away a lot, a lot of things and converted my bedroom closet into a studio, which cost me twice as much as I anticipated because I listened to a lot of people and I was trying to save money while doing it. And in doing so, I spent twice as much as I thought I would. Um, but I did launch an audiobook career. And I do know how, I can say that I have edited, mastered, proofed 10 hour audiobooks that I've recorded myself, which I could not have told you that maybe four years ago. Um, I'm trying to think if this is all I want to say about that. What I found was I had to try to cultivate my fans as opposed to knocking on the doors that weren't taking me at the moment. I had to see when a door opened, as fearful as I was or unsure of whether it was, not always fearful, but sometimes just not excited about it. I had to go through the door and just see what it was. So I did some things that didn't work out for me, but I may go back to someday. I took a job, a part-time thing at the Fashion Institute downtown where you go out to the high schools and you do pitches. It didn't work for me because of my kids were young at the time. The schedule, even though it was pitched as a schedule that I could work with kids in school, you know, one of your kids gets sick and then you're stuck, you know, so anyway. Um, about a year ago, someone asked me if I would, two or, two or three years ago, would I coach their high school kid for the school play? So it got out that I was coaching kids for school plays. So I was coaching kids for that, for their college um, audition, you know, entrance auditions. And then someone asked me to teach a teen commercial class, which I'm still doing now. And my first instinct was, what? I want to get a commercial. I don't want to teach a teen. I'm not getting as many commercials as I think I should get. But then someone else said to me, really? Sit down tonight and just make a list of how many on-camera commercials you've made since you started your business. Well, you know, it's hundreds. It's just not as, I want it to be thousands more. So I started doing that. So I think that for me, I had to find, I'm still not, I'm still not done with it. And my goal, I have my new goal for till the end of this year is my audiobook work needs to double for myself to really consider it successful but it has become about a third of my income. I can do it at home, meaning I could really do it all night long if I have to. I still go on whatever auditions, I go on every single audition there is that they call me on um, because my, I'm all about pension and health. I'm all about that darn insurance. Um, so, so that has been, I mean, that is a, a, a success, but I'm not satisfied with where it is. It needs to double for it to be really um, reliable. I will say my next thing, whatever door opens, I'm hoping it's not quite so closely related to the entertainment business because the entertainment business is, even audiobooks is the entertainment business and there is an, an unknown variable there over which we have no control. The other thing about audiobooks, so I wanted something that I could solicit and promote on my own. It's very hard in LA. I actually have agents knock on wood, but if you don't have someone representing you, it's really hard to get to the people who can hire you. With audiobooks, you go right to the source. You can market to publishers, you can market to the production houses. So it became something, it was my make or break it. Either I do my one sheets and contact people and come up with a new sample and let everybody know when another book has been released or not. I still do that as an actor. I have something on the air. I have something, you know, if I have a prominent voiceover, something out there, uh, you know, commercial, I make sure I let all those casting people know. But it was something I could uh, solicit on my own. And I will tell you, it's not the million dollar business. I don't know if any of you know it. In the voiceover world, it's the most amount of words for the least amount of money. But here's the thing. I'm really good at long form narration and always have been. I, and I love to read. So it does have a few of the things that I love to read. Even a book that's not a brilliant book, I'm happy to read the book. So I thought, okay, this is a marriage there that works. 
I can do this, I read ahead very well on the line, I'm, I have good diction, I have a very strong voice, I can talk for six hours a day if I need to. I don't have an ending to this right now. I just kind of have to stop. Does this, have I said, so, but I do think that the, if the, I hadn't been, I was in a particularly great group, the On the Fence group, a very supportive group. There were only another, maybe one or two other actors in the group, but they even encouraged me to do some things like um, apply for financial aid at my kid's high school. I didn't want to because the old me, the other me, didn't have to apply for financial aid. And I said, well, that's financial aid for people who really can't. They're like, look at yourself. Right now, you can't write the check. So those, it sounds like a small thing, but to sit in with a group of supportive 10 or 12 people who said, no, you have, you're going to apply for it. If they don't think you deserve it, you're not going to get it. But they may. And I did get it a few thousand dollars that year, so, which, which helped. Um, Okay, I don't know, Joanne, anything well, else? Well, am yeah. I leaving something You can out? applaud, you can applaud, you, you can applaud. We always like applause, right? Um, I, I, you've said so much, I mean, you, you just really, uh, you know, I, I, how many of you feel like, just raise your hand, can identify with this up and down thing, oh, I think I'm there and then I'm not, and then I'm not, you know, and that kind of process, which is, which is what I love about all of your stories. It's not like, oh, I, I hit this and now I'm just, it's riding, you know, straight ahead, that there are these ups and downs that you have to go through. Can you speak a little bit more about really, because Sandra, Sandra spoke about it, and I think it's a big piece of it, but, but having community around you that is supportive, because sometimes it's even hard when you're, you know, other people that are in your business to talk about the feelings that are coming up. Yes, and I, I know that if there are other performers in the room, the, it's tough, you, it, you have to be careful who you complain to as an actor, um, because, well, let me talk, see how to put this. As much as I'm complaining about things to someone right next to me who is equally talented and capable, they don't have the same agents I do. So to them, I should, you know, zip it and stop complaining about it. Um, I have to say, I was, have always been very supported in my career. My parents did not even blink twice when I said I was going to be a drama major in school and that I was going to do that for a living. I had an aunt who was an opera singer, and my parents were both first-generation um, Italian-Americans. For them to just say, yeah, yeah, go, go for it, go for your dream. Um, and I had, when I was married, my husband was extremely supportive of what I did, a big fan. And, but it is hard sometimes when you want to change who you are. I just think I've been redefining so much that I've been, I'm in another language right now. I don't even know sometimes. Because as much as I was caught up in the, in the title, Nancy Lenari Actress, so were a lot of other people around you. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about letting that go, what they point up to is, well, you've never done anything else. You know, what do you, what do you have, what can you put on your resume? What can you, you know, what have you, what have you made money at other than this? And so you find yourself almost, I found myself almost thinking, wow, I'm so sorry I haven't had to do anything else for 20 years, you know. But, um, but for me, what was good was to listen to everyone else's stories, that I didn't feel quite so pathetic. Um, well, because, you know, I don't know about you guys, but it can be very, I felt very pathetic sometimes, you know. I can't, I, I've been working all this time and suddenly, you know, and some of that is not the industry's fault. I, I was at a commercial audition recently where everyone was lamenting the old days, the good old days, the good old days. When it was so different. And this guy next to me, who's my age, said, well, you know what, we're different. Mm -hmm. When you're 30, there is more work. There just is more work. So um, I might not be speaking to this appropriately, <laughs> am I? I kind of went off on... I think I scampered into the pasture just a little too far there from my barn. You can go um, back. Okay, I'm going back in. Um, <laughs> but I do think you have to have people who encourage you. And I looked, I mean, I have called Joanne, uh, I think it was just about, it was about six or seven months ago, and I emailed her and said, can I have like a little tune-up? Can, can I just come in and tell you where I am and how am I doing and 
What do I need to be doing? Because I'm, I'm still, as I say, I'm a work in progress. I do not believe that just adding audiobooks is all that's going to be for me. I think that there is more of me. Um, it's great to hear Sandra talk because she's using so much of who she is. And I think, I don't know how the other actors feel. Sometimes I feel I'm only using a part of the, what I have to give. Now, narrowing down what that is and where that turns into a paycheck, I'm not there yet. Um, but it is good for me to, when I walk into my emptied closet with just a few clothes hanging in there, think, I did all this. I know how to do this. Um, I can actually take the whole studio down and replug it all in, and it still works. <laughs> so I couldn't have done any of that a few years ago. So, and I did, even when I was putting the studio together and I said it cost me a lot of money, I had some very big helpers with that. Some, a studio I used to work at, the, the guy gave me every bit of advice he could possibly give me. People were emailing me solutions and links to things when I had a problem. So, um, even though what it meant was I wasn't going to be recording at their studio, I was going to be doing it in my own home for a, a more cost-effective, you know, result, they were still helping me. Um, but the, the groups at the Actors Fund, I thought, I don't know if all the groups are this particularly wonderful. We did two sessions with that group, if you remember. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. a very supportive group. Um, I don't know, that's all. <laughs> I, that's great. I, I want to speak to two things, though. Um, you know, the fact, uh, certainly at the Actors Fund uh, and, and in the way we look at everything, is we're looking at you in a holistic way. We're not just looking at the job you do, your career. We're looking at all the other aspects of who you are. And uh, what Nancy was referring to about, she called me, I was her career counselor and am, am your career counselor. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't erased that. I thought she fired um, me. I didn't fire you, no. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, along with that is I have a, we have a wonderful team. Uh, Mary Beth Abella, I think she's here. Um, Mary Beth Abella is a career counselor with us. Adara Blaine, um, uh, they, they teach workshops. If you need to learn about resume or job search strategies, social media, um, how to use, use that in terms of looking for work, art of interviewing, assessment, you know, those things are provided to you as well as the actual training and career counseling. And then we have these groups and that particular group is uh, collaborated with social services. But also they have money groups. Uh, Miata, who's on our staff for social service, she does an incredible uh, work with cash flow and uh, budgeting nuts and bolts. A lot of people in the business don't know much about how to deal with money because it's so like, now you have it, now you don't, and it gets very inconsistent. And so we feel it's very important that you understand and see yourself in a much fuller way, you know, and treat yourself not not being in a, such a wag the dog situation where everybody else is saying whether you can be at the at the plate or not. You know, what do you want to have happen in your life? What do you want your life to look like? So that's really what we're talking about here. Joy Tribble is also our uh, administrative assistant and she, she uh, takes care of that aspect of it. So we have quite a team, uh, uh, including career development, you know, because we're always job development. So we're always looking for jobs that are, are good fits for people. Uh, I was going to add yeah. one thing that uh, the, the fund put me in touch with, and I'm not going to be able to say it right. I went up to Santa Clarita to the College of the Canyons mm -hmm. because when I was, uh, when I went back to Joanne for my tune up, and I mentioned that I had started this audiobook thing and it was pretty launched, but I had to look at it as a business and not just me selling myself as an actor, that I, this was a brand. You put me in touch, and I did a, some sessions with a woman up there and some. Um, some s little groups, some seminars in, and she, the, the, I forget the woman's name, but she was lovely that I spoke with. Uh, Catherine? Yes, Catherine. Yeah. And she sat down with me and said, well, you need to look at this like a business. You need to have the business plan. How much of your week are you willing to put into this part of it? She, she kind of gave it to me as laid out on paper as a business, which I had not done a blueprint for it. Yeah, I hadn't done that before. So that was also, that was the, the fun put me in touch with those people. Great.
Great, thank you. Thank you. And we'll come back, you know, at that. We're going to be asking questions and all that. Now we're going to turn it over to Joel Landy. And uh, Joel, uh, you know, it's our first introduction uh, uh, and now a friend of the funds as well. So let us know a little bit about your story and how that's developed for sure. you. Sure. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, I came into acting later in life, so I think I've been spared from a lot of the carnage that uh, <laughs> some of the other panelists have been. But uh, no, I, you know, it's an interesting, it's a fun story, and uh, I'm very humbled, actually, to be invited to tell the story here. But uh, when I was in college, I was a wild hare, played rugby. I'm from the East Coast. I'm from New York, and really had very little ambition at that time to do much of anything. Joe, uh, bring your, your mic a little closer. Uh, very, any, uh, much ambition to do much of anything. This was when I was in college in New York. And I uh, met my roommate, and he was the first kind of reference point for me, for someone who really helped me get my, my thoughts together, my life together. I left college, went on to graduate school, and uh, worked in a hospital with patients recovering from uh, uh, cardiac disease, and had a degree in clinical physiology. And I loved what I did, but I knew that my next job was going to be an admin job, and I knew it was going to be boring. So I'm like, okay, what can I do? i got to cook something up. And my dad was a sub guy in the Navy, and so I, on a whim, I literally just picked up the phone and called the recruiter uh, on Long Island and said, what do you have for a guy like me? And they sent me a packet with this job as a safety officer uh, in the Navy, as an officer, and the hook was, you know, we'll teach you how to fly an airplane. I'm like, yeah, well, where else can you go and someone's going to pay you to learn how to fly an airplane? And uh, it was a phenomenal experience and came out here to California and uh, went through flight training in Pensacola. Uh, but it was my first real, uh, I, you know, I know it's a funny word, it was an epiphany, um, but I really, in the military, I had the dream job, and my personal life was falling apart. And I was about to get divorced from my wife, who I now have been together for for 27 years, which is exciting. Uh, but that was a time in my life, it was a turning point. That was the first major turning point where, you know, the long and the short of it was I was high on success and I was really low on family, and I haven't really figured out and took the time to figure out what were my values and you know, what was really driving me to be who I was and, and, and what I was. And so in that transition in this epiphany, um, we, part of me turning my life in a different direction was building a spiritual fabric. I actually became a Christian, and then I became a minister. And uh, it was a very unpredicted, uh, I never saw it coming on my radar screen, but I remember having this conversation with another minister, and I, I was like, you got the wrong guy. I mean, I've got a degree in physiology. It's not theology. I mean, how am I going to help these people? I mean, I think you got the wrong guy. And I'll never forget, he said, Joel, he said, you, you know, you're at a crossroads. I said, you can either, you know, help pilots put bombs on targets, or you can help people, you know, recapture a vision for their lives. Which one do you want to do? <laughs> you know? so, and it was pretty intense. And, uh, and so for the next 17 years, I was in the ministry. And it was probably the best 17 years because it really sensitized. You know, prior to that, I was all about innovation and being hard charging and doing exciting things and experiential learning and, you know, racing and all this stuff. But I really got sensitized to how important it is for all of us to feel like we need to grow. And if we're not growing, we feel like we're, you know, we're going backwards. And the one thing that kept coming up in the ministry was regret. And I felt that every time I got with somebody, whether it was they were average or they're very successful, when the words, you know, I, I wish I could have, I just remember feeling my spirit would just drop. And I thought, we need to do something to change the narrative and, and to turn this around. And it really... That actually formulated one of my favorite quotes that actually provided a foundation for my company, the Performance Group. But you know, Mark Twain once said, you know, 20 years from now, it will be the things that we did not do that we will regret more than the things we did. And that quote sat on the lens of my mind for two years. And two years later, um, my wife and I lost her parents, one to cancer, one to a heart attack within nine months. And I was at a crossroads as, as a minister of 17 years. And, this, and mind you, up to this point in my timeline, there's, acting is not on the radar. I mean, I'm not talking to anybody about acting. I have nothing to do with the acting world. Uh, and so I thought, OK, the parents die. And I'm thinking, I'm in a unique position. At the time, I was 46. Um, I'm going to step way out of the boat. And I'm going to look at these two deaths as a, as a hinge point for me to do something that I 
really am not planning to do. And at that time, I didn't even know what I was even talking about, but I knew that, that I was going to give myself permission to just do something very different. And, it, and in my mind, it took more faith to actually leave the ministry than it did to stay in the ministry. And so here I go again, you know, step out of the boat on faith. And so I um, did a lot of, you know, self-examination type work, read a book, Unique Ability, and I thought, and my, my first reference point was, okay, you know, for 20 years I've been helping people have these breakthrough experiences, you know, what, what should I do? You know, if, if you can do anything and write your own ticket. And I thought, okay, I'm going to actually develop a coaching business that is experiential, adventure-based, that helps people change their mindset and creates these novel opportunities for them to deal with their limiting beliefs so that they'll craft opportunities so that as they age, they will not have that conversation about the things that they regret they didn't do. And that was my passion, and it, and it is today. And so back in 2011, I'm on a racetrack, and one of the things after I left the ministry, and you know, when you leave the ministry, it's kind of like you talk about, you know, with the horse analogy, it's like you take the horse's headgear off, and now I'm running for the first time in 17 years, and I'm really running and having fun, and it's all wholesome, but I'm in a different mindset. And I go to the racetrack, and my, you know, my, which I had to overcome that with my wife, and I assured her, you know, much like I, she's like, you don't have any life insurance. What do you mean you're gonna go race motorcycles? You've got, I, I'm, you know, you got two daughters. And I said, look, I'll approach it like I did I'll learn how to fly an airplane. We'll do it by the book. We'll do it by the letter. It'll be safe. And um, so I show up at the racetrack and meet an actor who uh, was and still is at my same agency, NTA, and we begin to talk about life, and we begin to talk about what's important, and we begin to talk about risk-taking. And then out of the blue, he's like, you know, you've got a good look. He said, what are you doing right now? I said, well, I'm actually in the process of, you know, I know it's very LA, but I'm reinventing myself, and I have an idea. I want to do this coaching thing, but, you know, I'm wide open to almost everything, to a degree, but I'm wide open. I really am. I'm wide open. And so, you know, three pictures from my iPhone, and I get an interview at the agency, and I, you know, meet the president and one of the other uh, persons, and I sign, you know, sign on with the agency. And it's funny, because I go home, I talk to my wife, and in my mind, I'm thinking I'm signing up for this, this print experience. I didn't even understand that it had to do with commercials. And I'm thinking, okay, this is zero preparation, you just show up, I'm a face. I mean, the reason why I was invited here apparently was I'm arm candy. Like, okay, I can do that, I can just show up, I can look good, I don't have to open my mouth, this is easy. And my first experience, three months after I signed up with the agencies, I'm standing on a golf course with Ernie Els for Royal Bank of Canada, and I'm doing this spot, and I'm like, holy moly, you know, how, did I, how did I get here? And then from there, I took it really seriously, because I realized all the deficits that, you know, I didn't have any classical training, and, and that was the beginning of, of that piece of my life. And actually, it's been exciting. I've been very, you know, very fortunate and have been around the world. And one of our commercials just picked up an award at the, at, at the Cannes Festival, one in New York. And uh, it was, it's been a really interesting uh, experience and chapter in my life. But the thing that I'm more excited about, going back to this thing, is about, is about helping people. And this thing about risk, uh, regret. You know, and I think Sandra mentioned the concept of risk. And I remember reading this in a book four years ago, and it's never left me. And it says, uh, risk should always be evaluated not on the fear it produces or on the success it may bring, but on its value. And one of the things I do with clients is we talk a lot about value, and we clarify values. And I've met a lot of overwhelmed people. In fact, I was with a potential client in Calabasas four or five days ago. And what I've learned is when people are overwhelmed and they feel like they need therapy, it's very powerful when you sit down and you actually just really straighten out what your value system is. And you'd be surprised in a couple of hours how freed up and clear your mind gets when you are able to articulate, here are the things that I think are valuable for me. And like I know for me, spirituality and family are the two anchoring, guiding values for my life. But for my company, it's all about adventure, innovation, and achievement. But the achievement has a lot to do with more of an altruistic piece where it's not this blind, selfish ambition where you just want to go make money, but a lot of times the achievement is wrapped around how do, and this is me speaking in the first person, how does my presence benefit other people? And that was my turning point in the ministry, and I think that's why you know, God had moved me out of that situation. It was just, it was just too much self-focus. And so I've built you know, a small business and an exciting company on helping people overcome these limiting beliefs, because I, even though I had a neurophysiology background that I studied in my late 20s, I've come to find out now I'm 50, 
is everything really starts and ends in the subconscious. You know, the conscious mind told you this morning, you know, I should wear that yellow shirt or that blue shirt. Your subconscious mind right now is, is your belief system, and it is driving your behavior. And it does drive you when you show up to an audition like I know. I mean, I, I, and I don't have nearly the, the experience that some of the other women on the stage do, but I know enough to know that when I go to an audition, I can't, I don't subscribe to the whole fake it till you make it thing. It doesn't work for me. I mean, I've got to be authentic, but to Sandra's point, my authenticity needs to be rooted in beliefs that are constructed. And that's what the work that I'm doing now, my kids, you know, my kids laugh at me. I've got a 17-year-old, 14-year-old daughter, and they come into my office every morning, house office, and I got this weird Johnny White Feather music on, and I'm burning a candle, and I'm sitting there, my eyes closed, you know, and I'm just really trying to anchor my thoughts and get really clear on what I believe. And I, I mean, I love that part of my life, you know, and it's like exercise. I mean, I love exercising, but man, if you don't deal with what's between your ears, it's just a hardship waiting to happen over, over, and over. And to go back to what Sandra said too, um, you know, one of my favorite uh, proverbs is an African proverb. You know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And for me, you know, I think one of the, the coolest, I mean, and I've been very fortunate and done some really great adventurous things in life, but now, one of the things, the highest things that I find value in is being in a small group of people, four, six people, that really want to think and really want to innovate and create. And I can't agree more with what Sandra said that sometimes I think the limitation, and certainly it can be between the ears, but there's so much power in finding the right small group of people. And I want to say this carefully, because now this is me, ex-minister, is I'm, I, I believe I'm a very compassionate person. I want to help people. But if you're in a position where you're not where you're exactly you need to be, you can't be around people that are even where you're at or slightly below. In terms of being in the process of trying to rebuild something, you know, that's, that's significant for your life. And so um, that's what I, I help people with the whole the subconscious thinking. And I think one of the things that I've learned even from my own friends in the industry is that, you know, being caught in no man's land where you've got this passion, which is your acting, but then you've got the reality of the career. And we all know that there are, you know, everything's cyclical. So, you know, to Sandra's point, you know, you might make $20,000 one month, and then you might make nothing for three months. Uh, and, and what I've learned is one of the most debilitating things is, is to get caught between the two, to get caught between a career in, in acting that's not doing that well, but then because you are so bent in striving to make that work, then you, but you haven't taken the time to build this other piece of your life. And I do appreciate what Nancy, right? Nancy said is, um, is you know, treating that, it's a career. It's not an income stream, it's a career. You know, there's a plan. We talk about what the clients, after I do this rigorous value and belief assessment, you know, we talk about you know, getting, getting the right counsel, but then we come up with a plan that's got a milestone it's, uh, and expectations, and then we come up with accountability. And each week we talk about what happened and what didn't happen. And it's not a browbeating, but it's absolutely keeping people on schedule and holding them accountable to the things that they want to create uh, in their lives. So I think I said everything I needed to say, unless you have questions for me. I probably will have a question or two. Okay. Um, I, could you talk a little bit about, you also have a team building side of what you do in your business. Yes. Could you speak to that a little bit? Um, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm referencing Sandra quite a bit here. Uh, the comment that she made about coaching in the six month thing, I agree. I mean, I do, I do what I call a 72 hour immersion, which is like a boot camp experience for people. I work with clients for three days, it's intense, and they get a lot out of it. If I take a client on in another configuration, it's normally 90 days, uh, three months. Most of, the uh, most of the changes that happen in your mind with the way you think and your paradigms this is me speaking, speaking experientially, happen on the front end of the coaching relationship. The second half of the coaching relationship is normally how, to, how do you craft a preferable future and how do you master certain parts of your thinking so that you can set up a lifestyle where you don't need me. I, that's my approach to coaching is I want people to, you, don't, you know, you don't depend on me, you don't need me, I'm available, but I wanna make you self-sufficient. So getting back to your question, um, what we do is we take, we take a small handful of clients out to the racetrack. 
Um, I love racing, I race motorcycles, I'd like to race cars in the future if I can find somebody, to, maybe, the, maybe your fund can fund me or something like that, I'm just kidding, that's not at all what I would do. Um, <laughs> but I, we take people out, we put them in the race car, the race cars are very sophisticated and they've got data acquisition and basically it's really cool because the race car can tell me as a coach when a client's putting the brake on, how hard they're putting the brake on, it can tell me when they're turning into a corner, so it gives me all this information that we then come back into the pit area and we sit down and we talk about their performance. From these data points, we create a very compelling portrait of how they are doing in the race car. And you'd be surprised to find out what they do in a race car is what they do at work. It's what they do with their kids. I was going to say it's what they do in the bedroom, but that's probably a real stretch. But, but you, you can see all the translation of, of what they're doing and not doing. You know, things as simple as people not, you know, you know, you know, we talk about vision, how people on a racetrack, if you don't look, look through a corner, you can't get through a corner. You actually have to look ahead on a racetrack, and it's very emblematic of us having vision or not having vision in life. So we do that in small groups. It's exciting. It's dynamic. The cars use as a tool for data points. And uh, I do believe, and one of the things that's really energizing me right now is uh, in the neuroscience community, I'll be very brief on this, but... Uh, for years, for decades, all the thought leaders uh, and scientists have told us that the human brain is static. Once you have a bad experience, a negative emotion, it becomes, um, it's locked in and what you have to do then is actually uh, develop compensatory mechanisms. Now what we know about neuroscience is really cool. And if you think a certain way and you've thought a certain way for 30 years, what neuroscience is now telling us is it can change and it can change quickly. That's cool, and that's one of the coolest things when I work with clients, when I tell them that, because I believe part of the transformation experience is when you even volitionally understand that the mind is capable very quickly of change. And so that's uh, the whole neuroscience approach to coaching is fun for us, and we, we do all sorts of fun stuff with clients like that. And, and you've been in since 2011. Has it been financially, I mean, your business is still in a growing point, point but... Uh, lucrative enough to keep make a living really. we are we're not at capacity right now with my clients my approach was slightly different and i ha hired a couple of people to to brand me this way but my company has been branded at a higher level uh, more of a luxury brand type level and so our growth curve has been very very slow um, i will say this because of that we've got some interesting looks and we actually right now are in contract to shoot a sizzle reel about this concept being uh, something for uh, in the media for television. So, um, but to answer your question, we have not, we're not at capacity, but we've had to build slow. And in fact, one of my friends uh, who's an entrepreneur told me, you know, Joel, consider, consider the bamboo tree. And, uh, you know, apparently I didn't know this, but the bamboo tree, I, when it's planted, doesn't grow at all for three years. In the third or fourth year, it grows 90 feet. And it really is a great metaphor for when we start something that really has value. I'm convinced of what I do has a lot of value. And I've been doing it for 20 years. It's now in this, in this business, it's a new wrapper, but I've been doing it for 20 years. So I've got to stomach, you know, like you, I've got to stomach the valley and continue to build and, and, and have the marathon legs and keep the right people on the bus and uh, stay enthusiastic. Thank you, Joel. I'm Welcome. sure there'll be some other questions. By the way, if you, let's give him an applause. Give everybody an applause. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but we'll, we'll be continuing this conversation. Uh, if you have any questions, please put your card up because uh, uh, Dennis will, or someone will come down and, and pick up your card. And uh, there's one up here I see on the, in the front row. So, uh, because we, we will be reading your questions uh, a little bit later. Okay, let me turn it over to Mary Ann, who's been a very big, important part of the Actors Work Program because you gave us such great support last year. So, welcome, Mary Ann. Hi. Um, I'm Mary Ann Bevener, and I have two degrees. I have an MBA from University of California at Berkeley, and I have a clown diploma from Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Clown College. <laughs> It is unusual for me to speak to people because I started out as a mime. <laughs> my current job, uh, I've, I've been doing telesales, uh, which is selling over the phone, uh, not in person, for many, many years, for over 20 years. 
So that's the kind of stuff that I'd like to talk about today and where I was a year ago at this time. So just a year ago um, in October, I was a volunteer at the Actors Fund making copies of stuff. <laughs> and then people's evaluations that you're going to fill out at the end of this, I would rate your evaluations and so they could improve their programs. I also um, am, am an actress and I intern, they call it interning, one day a week at my um, agency and I've been doing that for eight years. And when I started there, my boss there was 22 years old. She's now 30, so I asked her advice before I came here. And because we get along. <laughs> Otherwise, even if you're volunteering and people don't like you, they don't want you around. Um, and so what she said was financial stability before the creative. Because they work with a lot of different actors and um, other individuals. And if you've got that financial stability, you end up having a, a more successful career. That's, I'm just giving you somebody else's opinion on that. So my entire life, I've kind of gone that route. I've gone, I've had a parallel career, and I have had a full-time job and then doing the creative on the side. So basically, I find a job that pays me enough money that I find a creative job that I can do and then be able to do my creative stuff outside the 40-hour work week. Now, in reality, my entire career has not been a 40-hour work week. It's been 60. It depends. It goes up and down. But that's no different than being a writer or an actor uh, at any time, uh, the flexibility in that. Uh, it's the third time I've used the Actors Fund. So last year, when I was volunteering, I was um, out interviewing. And uh, oh, I should also say I was volunteering, because I heard somebody talking about it earlier. If there's an industry you're interested in, Go online, find their trade show, and then call them up and volunteer to, to work that trade show. Uh, so that, like, there was Digital Hollywood is in town this week, right? And I used, I've been a volunteer with them for five years. So I go out there and, and usually get the registration desk. And then you get to sit on some of the seminars and you find out interesting things about that industry before you decide to go into that industry. So that was last year at this time. And then I called up, I've been interviewing for full-time jobs, and I called up my old boss, and he says, no, wait a second, I just went to this new company. You've got to interview here. <laughs> so by the time I interviewed there, which was in, in I, I had a phone interview first, because you have to be good on the phone. Um, I had a phone interview, I got to my audition earlier, like an hour early for the audition. I had a phone interview at 11, went into the audition, <laughs> did the audition, came out, and then ended up, you know, getting this job. And one of the questions they asked me, the hardest part, I guess I should say, the hardest part for me in interviewing is that I'm not used to talking about myself because I'm a salesperson. I listen to what other people are saying. So it was hard for me to go back and revisit what I did. Like even before today, I had to go out and print out my resume in case anybody asked me, what had you been doing? You know, what's your specialty? What do you do? I'd I, remit, I know it, but I don't talk about it very often. Um, so uh, when I was being interviewed, they said, well, if you don't get this job, what will you do? And they go, well, I'm a volunteer at the Actors Fund, and they seem to like me. I'm uh, also with the CERT team, Community Emergency Response Team, uh, by, the, by the, where am I at? LA, <laughs> Los Angeles Fire Department. So I'm a volunteer for that. Um, I have two other part-time job offers and one starts on Monday. <laughs> so within 24 hours I had a job offer for a full-time job, full benefits, working from home and I'm managed out of Austin, Texas. <laughs> so I'm in, I like Austin now too. So, so, so I feel very lucky. Now that isn't, I'm going backwards. Is, that's okay. All right. The, uh, and checking with Joanne, she didn't, uh, the, um, the second to last time I used the Actors Fund was when I hadn't been working for a number of years because I moved from San Francisco uh, down to LA and I decided, well, no, I, instead of just the acting, I want to, um, and I'm also, also, I'm also a writer, so any writers in the audience, we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, the, 
I was like, what do I want to say? Um, as a, so I wanted to get, well, let me just go to work part-time. I bet I could get a part-time job. So I came to the Actors Fund and I learned how to use Indeed.com and I found a job. And before I went to interview for the job, I took the classes that Joanne had in interviewing technique and she reminded me of what I'd done in the past and what to bring up. And it is the same as in acting or when you're a writer. When you're talking about yourself, it's not so much, it's that the desperateness as long as a desperateness, you're not desperate. If you're just comfortable in yourself, you need know, to say about bringing yourself, if you're just comfortable in yourself, and I didn't find that out till six months later that that's why they hired me, because the other people that come in for this part-time job were desperate. So um, maybe I was desperate, but to me it was more interesting hearing what their company was doing than, I, than about myself. So the first time I found out about the actors from, Actors fun, <laughs> actors fun. We're fun too. We're we're a fun fund. <laughs> it's okay. Um, was uh, in 2009 when they were testing for uh, people to to do the census. So I worked for the U.S. government as a census taker <laughs> in the first round in 2009, um, and that was interesting. And when I was there, as they tested me. I, I just got to stop taking these tests. I just don't recommend these tests. Especially if you, th you were, you know, maybe you're raised to do well at tests, and maybe I was raised that way, so I did well at the tests, and they promoted me to a supervisor. And then all of a sudden, I was supervising 23 people <laughs> and doing a census, and they were all very smart actors, writers. <laughs> And they were really good at their storytelling as to why they weren't showing up on the job. <laughs> and I said, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> because I didn't get into sales as an individual contributor until I was 37. Prior to that, I spent 15 years managing people. And then I had to say, I didn't like that. I didn't want to do that anymore. <laughs> and I made much more money in sales in doing that. So I just want to say at 37 is when I went into sales. And if you've got questions about sales, customer service, what type of jobs are out there, I can talk to you about that if you've got questions about that. But I do want to make clear is that I'm very proud of being a salesperson. I get up every morning, I do not have a job. And, and it's, I'm only as good as what I sold that day. That sounds kind of harsh, but that's the same as any writer or, or probably or any other creative person too. So as I told, some other people I work with, I go, basically my job is my entertainment. I make sure that I manage it as an entrepreneur, even though somebody else is paying me full time to do this. And um, I think it's uh, important about the sales is that you, I'm proud of being a person, person that will listen to other people and see if there's a fit for what we have to do. So that's what I want to say about sales versus customer service, but there's a lot of great jobs out there. And if you can prove that you've done it and quantify what you're doing, anything, the Actors Fund teaches you a lot about that, about um, knowing what you did, documenting what you did, a methodology to how you do it, and that you've done in your life. And they are able to pull information from you that is um, a transferable skill. That's the term. And the transferable skills, if I talk to any of you, it'd be easy to figure out what, oh, your skill is, what your talent is. And other people will pay you to do it for them so that you have the money and time to do, um, to do the other creative things that you want. So um, I got my little cheat sheet here because used to, I'm, I don't really always work off a script, but that's what some salespeople are. But So I just want to take a really quick thing to see. Um, uh, I guess the other thing I would say when you're volunteering and then when you're networking is what's been brought up before from the, uh, from the other panelists is that you are the product. Um, you need to develop your own marketing plan about yourself when you're looking for a job or in anything you're doing. At my company, I'm always having to rewrite. I take other stuff that people have, have written, um, the marketing department, I rewrite it for each individual type of company that I'm working with because I'm, do, I'm doing business development. And so um, 
in networking, you want to say three things. I am, this is the three things I can do. I can do this, I can do that, I can that, and this is what I want from you. And if you just remember that, just can say these are the three things I know that I do really well. Um, and tell people about that and say, can you help me do this? And that's what sales is, asking for something. If you don't ask, you don't get. And in particular, if we start talking about age differences with people, we could talk about that a little bit more. I'll wait till Joanne asks a question on that. But that's the same thing with um, having been a woman in business for as many years as I've been in business. And by the way, it was the clown diploma that got me into Berkeley. So, <laughs> um, and I have been able to work, if we go back further, I've worked with um, a lot of nonprofits. I actually was a president of the board of Make a Circus, if anybody knows that, out of San Francisco. We were around for 25 years. And um, that's how I've been able to contribute creatively um, that way besides my own writing, which I started doing when I was 40 because I had something to say. And of course, it was about technology because I'm a little computer nerd debt. And I was very upset about why everybody was calling people webmasters. So I became the webmistress. <laughs> So I think that's where I'll end right now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You covered so much information that I, I, I but I do have questions that'll, that'll, right. that'll go for all of you. Um, I hope you're getting some very good information because I'm, I'm excited. I'm just so excited because you ask people and you know a certain amount about them, but I'm learning certain things too. Uh, I'm going to ask some questions from the audience, which is kind of cool. And uh, this one's from Kay Oliver. Uh, uh, Joel mentioned giving himself permission to take the leap. Did the others, others of you do this for themselves as well? If not, what did, the, what did you do to break through the fear? Or you might even say presently, what do you do to break through the fear? Because the fear could still be there, you know, under different, right. um, different masks, right? Yes, and, and this is a question for me. This is a question for all, all of you. Us. You had yeah. mentioned it yourself. You, okay. I think you, you addressed you, it already. Want, you you addressed it oh, okay. before, I think you addressed unless it you want to uh, um, talk a little more on it. Yeah, I, I am actually. I mean, I think if you if you have if you're an entrepreneur, there's every day you're going to have to take a leap. I mean, every day you're going to have to face some sort of fear. And with what I do, I help people through all different kinds of fear, um, as is Joel as well. So um, you know, like right now. I'm at the point where I'm getting a lot of pressure to build the horse portion, which is called Horse Powered. It's horsepowered.net. And um, that portion of my, of my work, I'm really getting people, I'm, I'm doing what I don't usually do, which is I'm starting out cautiously, but I'm getting the pressure to build it. Build it, when are you doing the next one? And it's a little scary. So when I start to get apprehensive about it or worried, which does no good for you, by the way, um, my mother was a chronic worrier. I should learn from her experience that it doesn't do anything beneficial. So I try to stop myself and I find a quiet place. I listen to, what was the music you listened to? I called it Johnny Whitefeather, but I don't know. It's some I don't Pandora know. Channel. I light a That's, candle. Yes. Uh, but, but really, I just do what I, what I teach, which is I shut everything off except just listening. And where I move to, environment is huge. Where I moved to, I'm so happy with that because I even have like a little tree house that is a little zen area. And it's just a place where I go and I'm quiet and I visualize what if it works. And that helps me. Right. That helps me a lot. And then if somebody comes up and pressures me to go in a direction, I not only can see what it would be like if it worked, but I have to do that qualification where, who's, who's the voice? Where is it coming from? Do they agree with my values? Know your, who said know your values? That was brilliant. That was really good. Um, that's huge. You know, does this direction, does this push, is it going in the direction of my values and what is important to me and where my strengths are? And if so, then step forward. But um, being quiet is probably the thing that sometimes is the hardest, but it's just the most valuable for me. 
And I just want to just throw out that anxiety and fear and all that are very, very normal. You know, if you're not sure how you're going to pay your rent next month, you know, that's going to make you feel kind of anxious or you feel like you don't know what's, you know, what the next options are going to be, you know, in six months even. You know, it, you, you can get those kind of uh, things happening. How about some of else, anybody else here? Nancy. I uh, have a couple of friends that I go to. Um, one of them, we call it our accountability um, emails. We'll try to get together. It doesn't happen every day. It doesn't always happen every week, but at least once a week. And she'll say, what have you done towards what those three goals we talked about? And then I'll, I'll make a list and she'll say, well, can you really do those this week? Pick the three things you can do and are you going to do them? And then we, we're pretty good about emailing each other or texting the person, did you do those two things? Text me as soon as you do those things. Pick up the phone now and make the phone call. So I rely on, um, I'm not a good meditator. I'm sitting between the really spiritual people. So I'm, I'm not. I always think it just, I just want it to go faster. I just want to meditate faster. Um, so, so I mean. We'll talk about surrender you're all, next. You're all knowing a lot of, yeah. You're all knowing a lot yeah. about my flaws. Um, I started there. It's okay. So, so I have people that I go to, and I have different people I go to for different things. Because I have some people who are just cheerleaders, and sometimes that's what I need. Yeah. But I have some people who are challenging me. Um, and you learn very quickly who you don't want to go to. You know, yeah. uh, who doesn't like the idea that you're going to do something new, whatever that means to them about themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do. I go to, I might light a candle while I'm doing my accountability <laughs> check. <laughs> Add a little enlightenment to it, yeah. the experience. How about you? And anything in terms of that area well, that? I like the other two answers. <laughs> okay. Okay. Could, yes. could I add something sure, to that? Sure. Sure. So I think uh, overcoming fears, preparation. Uh, and I know it sounds simplistic, but I think I've some of the greatest motivators in my life have been people that have taught me to keep things simple. Mm -hmm. And if you're about to jump into something new or craft something different. The more homework you've done, you have done, and the more clear it is to you about what you're going to attempt to do, even though you know the fear of not knowing the outcome is normal. So that's a normal fear you need to own. Excuse me. But, but that was an unintentional public display of affection. I can assure you that. It might have been subconscious. I don't know. But, but um, Smiling. <laughs> now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> So yeah, preparation. And two is separating out irrational from rational fears. I had such a fun conversation. I was in Berlin pitching my company in a group, of, well, not nearly this big, it was probably 20 people and a couple, were, they actually worked out something in public. And long and short of it was, he wanted to platform jump, do some bungee things. She was adamantly opposed. And we walked through what the real issue was. And the real issue was actually her because to jump off certain platforms in certain configurations is safer than you and I getting into the elevator, but you got to work through that. You know, so there's an irrational part of you having to jump. You got to know what you're really, what is the, the real fear and what's the irrational piece. If you do those two things, I have found the fear has dissipated significantly. I think at this time I'd like to add, uh, when you talk about fear, is that um, at another place that I went, prior to the Actors Fund in San Francisco, um, they taught me to have a job search weekly goals. And you always had to have one item on it, which was beyond your comfort zone. And you got to reward yourself once you accomplished that. And it was as simple sometimes as picking up the phone and calling someone that you didn't want to tell or, you, or something about. But the rewards initially, <laughs> were pretty big <laughs> and then you got so successful at just doing that one thing a week um, and it's still in my sales job I do that picking up the phone you know I have to pick up the phone and call somebody that may not want to talk to me um, I reward myself afterwards it may be that I end up calling a customer I like or there's a a great 800 number which I should give you which I didn't bring with me <laughs> but um, if you ever aren't happy one day just call look up the phone number for a Piggly Wiggly and see how they answer the phone. <laughs> uh, 
They're yeah. going to have, you know, the entire, that nobody will be able to get a hold of Piggly Wiggly because there'll be so many phone calls, oh, you know, I, at one point, you know. I, I have one other place to call. Sleep, call sleep number and find out what happens and you call the sleep number. number. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. Are they snoring or, you know, no, I'm, I'm kidding. It's a surprise. Um, okay, this one's from Kelly and this is for all of you. What have you found is the best way to network and cultivate fans, i.e. potential employers, mentors? Thank you. <laughs> how, how do you, how do you, um, I, I think this really just gets into how you, how you network, you know, in general. Go ahead, I know you network. Well, yeah, I met I, her in a networking group, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it is, if you, whatever you love, like say, I, I love wine. I, I like to go wine tasting. I like to drink wine. Um, <laughs> I haven't had any so far today though. But, uh, but if there's something like that or, or cars, you know, racing, um, I liked horses. There, there's there's got to be things that you enjoy, even if it's you know movies, going to screenings. That's where you can network. That's where you can start up a conversation with somebody. And my least favorite thing to ask somebody when you are networking in any fashion is, what do you do? Somebody mentioned questions that you ask, and the question that you ask will the the quality of your questions determines the quality of your relationships. So. If, and actually the quality of your life, if you want to take it a step further. So if you ask the right questions, I mean, think of it as you have one chance to ask a question about somebody and learn something about them. As soon as somebody says to you, what do you do? You say, I am a, and you put a label on yourself. And then a human nature is, well, I don't need that right now. So don't ask, what do you do? Don't put people in that situation to put a label on themselves, even though we're very comfortable doing that. Ask them something fun. Ask them, you know, have you had this wine before? What's the best thing that happened to you this week? You know, what, do you, what are your plans for Halloween? If you ask the right question, if you say, hey, if you could go away tomorrow on vacation, where'd you go, who would you go with? And that person would give you more information about themselves, their relationship, whether they travel, whether they don't, you'd find out if they're afraid of flying. Right? All the things you can find out about somebody if you ask an interesting question. That's the best way to network. Then you find the people that resonate with you. Maybe you find somebody that loves to, you know, race around a racetrack, um, and and you bond with them on that. And that is how you build relationships, which is how you network. You don't walk in going, "Who's going to hire me?" That's the worst thing, you know. So um, I make networking fun. I used to hate it. I used to hate it when I had to go in and go. So what do you do? And then I had to answer the same question. Blah. No, just have. Find a fun way. We're creatives. Find a creative question. Right, and also just finding places, you, you, you sp always spoke to this a little bit, places you're interested in. Like be around other people that are, I always call, find your tribe, you know. Mm -hmm. Find those people that are interested in similar things that you're interested in, because it'll be much easier to get into conversations with people because you'll have much more to talk about. And it's not that you want to work, <laughs> like say, I wouldn't go to a wine tasting thing, I want to work in the wine area, necessarily. But I would go wine tasting, and even in my current business, I met a guy a couple of times that was in the wine group with me. They had special tastings on certain days. And he was, he did interviews, he was a, I guess he wasn't a detective, he was a police officer, but he did interviews for people that were suspected of doing a crime. So, interrogations, right? He was the interrogation specialist. Of course, I think this is super cool, right? Um, so I'm like, well, tell me about that, you know? And it was funny because we ended up striking up a relationship, a fun, you know, friendship. And I said, I wanna have you come in and I wanna interview you for my people because he reads body language, he does all that stuff. I teach interview technique. It's perfect, it's a little bit outside of the box, but how cool, right? So I was networking for my business at a wine tasting. It had nothing to do with the wine. Mm -hmm. So when she says, you know, go where you have the things that you like to do, hang out with people that like the same things you do. Isn't that better? I think. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't yeah. hurt at all. Also, joining professional organizations that are doing things uh, you know, uh, there's a professional organization for practically everything, and you can go to those type of meetings or dinners, or or uh, sometimes they have a class or a workshop. That type of situation can be most helpful. Um, I'm going to go on to the next question. Uh, could you provide? This is for you, 
uh, Nancy. Uh, could you provide additional details on how to market your audio book to customers and publishers? Well, I don't actually market my, I don't write, but I, and I don't have the rights to any audio book. So what I am really marketing is myself as a narrator slash producer. And actually, if you, if you're an AFTRA member, uh, you can just call after and ask to speak to somebody, uh, I think it's Steve Sadawi there, S-I-D-A-W-I, and there is a list of audiobook producers in the country that they can give you. The other thing you can do is go to the library. Some are better than others for their audiobook selection. Their, uh, Burbank Library has a great selection. Uh, Beverly Hills Library does. Grab 10 audiobooks and read the back covers. Or go to audible.com, mm -hmm. which is the biggest supplier of audiobooks in the world, and click on, go to a genre you think might be interesting, or go to an author or uh, Google uh, Audi award-winning uh, audiobook narrators, and you'll come up with a list. Go and find some stuff they've done, and if you click on the selection, besides hearing them, it'll give you the list of everybody who's done something on that book. The, if it's uh, a book by, I'm trying to think, like Simon & Schuster, but it was pr produced by uh, the Deanne Studio, it'll give you all that information. You know, the internet now makes it really possible to get all this stuff. So that's where I started, by, by going on to audible.com, and I, I first Googled women who work all the time in audiobooks and seeing who, you know, sort of where my competition was. And I listened to a bunch of people to see, uh, I could do her, she's too young, she's too uh, character -y. And then I went and listened to what they did and looked at the kind of producers that they work for and then went to those audiobook, those websites and snooped around to see what are the genres here. Um, does, that, does that help? Or is there something more yeah. specific? Um, Does that help? <laughs> Joel. Yeah. That's who. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Joel. And uh, that was another Joel. Uh, recommendations uh, for building clients, for those of you that have your own business, um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you manage that in terms of building clients? Yeah, go ahead, Joel. Uh, we have spent a lot of money historically on campaigns and websites and uh, you know going to functions and those are fun and meeting people and what I've come to this is my personal conclusion is that probably 80% of my company uh, is word of mouth and so I think being out in the community I often if I have a choice of working in my home office or going down to a, cu a cup of, uh, get a cup of coffee of course I'll always go down if, if I can do that kind of work I'll do most of my work in public and I'm always meeting people. And I think one of the panelists touched on this. I think one of the greatest way to just start the, the conversation is a common interest. You know, I love bicycles. I love motorcycles. I like cars. I mean, there's a lot of things out, you know, surfing. Uh, so it's very easy for me to connect immediately with somebody on a mutual passion. And then from there, a discussion that will lend itself to, you know, what are you doing in this area? Who do you know? And then it's just being bold and asking, you know, could you connect me too? And I've had very interesting conversations with people like that that have been fruitful. So one of the things we always suggest is informational interviews. Uh, in a way, Nancy, you were talking about that a little bit, looking up the audio people that are doing really well. But talking to people that are doing what you're interested in doing, you know, and, uh, and letting them know. So it's not necessarily that you're selling something to them, but you're just having the conversation because um, that's how you build a network and ultimately that's how you find clients. I know when I did consultant work, uh, even in career counseling uh, for years, um, a lot of the clients I would get were based on informational interviews I had with people or people that I met at uh, associations that I belong to, you know, like they would say, oh, I can't take this job, but I know somebody that you maybe should talk to, you know, and that's how I would, that's how they would land on my uh, doorstep, so to speak. Yes. I, I get, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, speaking is how I get most of mine. Um, granted, the speaking platform for me was pretty easy because I was recognizable from acting. So that's in a lot of other cities outside of here. Um, that's kind of cool to people. And um, so I, I actually hired a coach who um, was, it seemed like an exorbitant amount of money to me at the time. But I didn't mind paying it because she gave me 
um, which is this is what I do now for people. But I went, sat with her, and um, and I'm glad to do this because I realized the value after this. I went through this. I went, sat with her, told her what I wanted to talk about, who I wanted to reach, and she worked up a platform for me to speak, and gave me bullet points to hit on, and I then had a platform speech to go out and start touching people with, and that is what started me doing that, which is a whole, you know, stepping out of your comfort zone thing. But it was, it, it works great in getting up in front of people and just sharing what you know, even in a small area. If you like health and fitness and you have something that qualifies you, speak at Whole Foods. I think they, they used to have um, venues for people to speak. Just share what you know. And you're probably an expert in something outside of acting. And if you are, then, find a way you can share that information. So it, it opens you up to different people and that's how you can meet people too. Uh, go ahead. I wanna um, add that uh, people use, use LinkedIn to look up people. You can do it for free. Mm -hmm. uh, the Actors Fund advocates that. Mm -hmm. And I wanna thank the one individual that connected with me on LinkedIn before I did this presentation today. I was impressed. <laughs> Yeah, LinkedIn is a really good in social media. I do want to say, though, that if you can get one-to-one, -one, have a cup of coffee with someone or meet with someone. You know, we live in an age now that, I mean, I was in the elevator c coming into work and everybody was on their phone. And I'm thinking, here's this great opportunity for us all to have a conversation and nobody's available. And it's, uh, it's, it's crazy. It's an absolutely crazy world we live in in that way. We, um, it's, it's almost rude. I went, I went, you go in the ladies' room and somebody's at the stall right next to you, or the men's room, you know, like that, talking on the phone, you know, like that. It's just crazy. It, but, you know, here, here a human being is right next to you and you, 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 there's no conversation. Have you ever heard them say hello and you go hello and then they start talking on the phone? You're yeah. like, oh. Yeah. I started humming. I actually started humming. I started singing a song, and, and she said, "Would you please stop singing? I, you're, I, my, my, my person can't hear me." So I was just gonna, but it was fun. Can I just add one thing? moment? I, I have found in the audiobook world for me, I have I show up. I go to New York for the audiobook con conference. I need them to. I am a much better presenter in person. Mm -hmm. They need to yeah. see me, like me or not. They'll, they'll make an impression. And I am a huge believer in snail mail for actors for whatever it is. I know they throw away what we send them, but in order to throw it away, they first have to open the envelope and it passes through. Whereas I feel, I email a lot for audiobooks. I'm emailing new links all the time, but they can delete an email very, very quickly from someone they don't know. I, so I'm a huge believer in, it doesn't have to be elaborate, it, but I do follow up and I introduce myself and I send things out all the time snail mail. That could be an old fashioned thing, about me. It's very retro. It is retro. Thank you. That's a better one. See, look the spin she put on that. I'm not old fashioned, I'm retro. Yes. Thank you. Well, you know, another, another piece of that is that when you do meet people and, and everything, sending them a card, uh, you think about it, when you come home and you get your mail, most, most of it's going to be stuff that, oh my God, yeah, another bill, another bill. You see something that's handwritten, a card, and you've got all that mail to pick up, which one are you gonna open up first? So it is a weird thing that something like snail mail has become a very easy way to be able to get in and make that connection. I think we just have a couple more minutes, so I uh, just wanna uh, ask you guys, is, is, is there anything else that you wanna just open up? L let me just ask this, this question, because I think it's an important thing so we're not walking around the elephant. The whole idea of being, you know, it's, it's funny, it's, it's as if uh, somebody asked some jazz singer years and years ago when he was in his 90s and they said, they said, uh, how does it feel living till you're 95 years old? And he said, well, it's, it's better than the alternative, you know. And, uh, but, but in terms of the whole idea of becoming more mature out in the world, what do you think that that brings you? to the workplace that you didn't have 20 years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago, you know, whatever that might mean for you. Anybody, does anybody have any responses to that, Nancy? Well, when we, this kind of ties in just a little bit to the fear question from before, because one of the things I do for myself 
And I'm fearful a lot. I mean, I, every, I, it's very easy for me just not to do the things I'm supposed to do out of fear of the, I call it the dope factor. I don't want to be a dope. I don't want to look like a dope. But I think to some of the, the worst thing I've ever been through, having my husband drop dead with two small children to raise, he was the love of my life. I think, how bad can this next thing really be? So what I think I bring to the party is, uh, as an older person, is there's a, wisdom sounds like just a catch-all word, but there really is a priority to a lot of what happens day to day. And we are, we're, especially with social media, I think everything gets, everything's important, everything's in big capital letters and, and smiley faces and everything. It's not all that way. So sometimes I think what happens as you get older, you cut to it a little more quickly. You know, like me or not, don't pick me for the audiobook, but just tell me. Don't, you know what I mean? Don't tell me how great I am and then not pick me. Just say, you're not right for this. Fine, I can move on. So something, does that help a little? It's a little bit more. You're more of an essentialist. Yes, get to, yeah. and I tend to be anyway. So it's a little magnified for me. I think we're speaking to the authentic self and authenticity. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we're going to give you just one more thing and then we, we, we have to end on this. What do you want to say? Uh, just that, you know, we get older, we're wiser, I think we're more practical, we have solutions. But for me, I feel like I've been more sensitized and empathetic to other people. And I think at the end of the day, the ability to connect with one another is going to open a lot of doors. And I think younger, I was always thinking, you know, I didn't know enough. And now I'm seeing to the degree that I can actually be present and connect with another person is the degree that it goes to the next step. And I think that's a very comforting thought for all of us to leave with today is that we all have the ability to do that, but we've got, going back to Joanne's point about being so fragmented and distracted, you know, if we can just work on that piece of us that we can actually really get better at being fully present when we're with another human being, we'd probably be surprised to realize how much more we just get out of a couple, you know, a coffee appointment or a dinner and how much more we're listening and learning and taking it and be less frantic about trying to get something out of that moment. Thank you so much. I want us all to thank this wonderful panel. And I want to thank our, our partners in this uh, SAC Foundation. Thank you, Dennis, and your whole team. You know, wonderful, wonderful opportunity to speak to so many about a very important topic. Please, if you haven't been part of the Actors Fund, please feel free to come to an orientation, one o'clock on Mondays. We'd love to see you. We'd like to be able to help you in any way we can so then you, you can keep on doing what you love doing and be your authentic self. Thank you so much.